host a bunch of PF link uh, applications uh, in the cloud and how awesome it is and how anterior it is and use a lot of buzzwords and impress you guys or possibly bore you to tears. But then on Saturday, uh, we got hacked. So we talk about that instead because that's more fun. Uh, I'm this guy and I work here. And on Saturday at around 11 p.m., after I got home from uh, the bar, I got uh, a message from my uh, sysadmin uh, letting us know, uh, letting me know that we had just gotten rooted. And I, of course, immediately responded, where? And I heard the even worse news that it was we got rooted everywhere. <laughs> Literally, servers I didn't even know we had were also rooted. And my immediate response was sheer fright and terror, like this guy, and this guy, and this guy, and her. <laughs> and my next thought was, what do I do now? What, how do we fix this? And the reason I'm giving you this talk now is because I hope I can give you guys some, uh, some hard earned uh, advice on how to deal with this sort of security breach, what to do immediately afterwards, and how to recover over the next days and week. And then maybe I'll come back next year if we're still around and tell you how it all uh, ended up going for us. Uh, the first thing that most people will tell you when you get hacked is uh, to not panic. It's very important to not panic. But that's stupid because you're already panicking. You can't control that. So what you really have to do is just Try to stop panicking. Like, realize that your primal fear centers in your brain are already activated. They're shooting adrenaline into your system, and you're already panicking. And your brain really wants to make this bad thing go away, so it's going to make stupid decisions unless you get it under control. So you have to regain control first of yourself and then of the system that works with. And usually, most of the time, the vast majority of the time, that doesn't mean log in, kick the guy out, business as usual. It means shut the system down. It means take, take it offline, shut it down, take it off the internet, try to contain the failure as much as possible. It's very, very unlikely that you know the full extent of the exploit and that you know what parts of your system are and are not compromised. So the best and safest course of action is to just assume that everything is compromised and shut it down. It's going to suck. It's going to be difficult, especially if we're talking about uh, live sites, in our case, you know, over a thousand PH applications that we have to take down. Uh, so that sucks. It's going to hurt. Uh, you're not going to like it. You have to, you have to, you have to do it. You have to shut everything down, but keep all of your data around. Keep all of your log files. Keep all of your access records. Keep anything that they may have modified around. Don't, don't destroy disks. Don't, you know, in a, in a bit of hoping to cover everything up, try to get rid of evidence. You're going to want it later. You're going to want to understand how this exploit happened, how you can prevent it in the future, and possibly if you have any legal recourse, you're going to need evidence to document it uh, for your legal counsel and, and whatnot as well. So let me talk to you a bit about how, uh, how this happened to us. And in order to do that, I have to give the original talk that I was going to give, which is to explain our infrastructure to you. So, the way PHP Fog's infrastructure works is we have a multi-tier system for every PHP application that we use, that we uh, host, where we start out with a cache, we use Varnish for this, we then load balance using Nginx to a number of app servers, and then each of those app servers reads off of a DB master and clone, and in the case that all of your app servers are down, which rarely, rarely happens, but just in case we have a shared uh, Apache failover environment, and that is uh, actually where the trouble started. So it started in the shared environment, and then this quickly happened. And the reason it started in the shared environment is because we did a very stupid thing. Uh, we didn't secure it properly. And at the end of the talk, all of you people who have never done stupid things can tell me how dumb I was, uh, how dumb we were to not have secured this properly. Uh, but uh, one thing you have to understand is when you're running a startup and you're running very lean, you don't have a very large team, sometimes uh, when you make trade-offs between developing new features and security, you make the wrong trade-off. You make a really stupid trade-off. And so we made a very stupid trade-off. 
when we should have been focusing on security, we were instead focusing on new features. So don't, there's one takeaway I can give you guys. Uh, if, you're, if you have uh, anything connected to the internet, make sure it's secure first. Or at least make sure it's secure as you can make it. Uh, don't, don't expect that, that you're not popular yet, popular yet so people won't find you. Sorry, guys. By the way, do you like my Caucasian themed uh, ch uh, cheek mic here? <laughs> it's, it's skin tone, but really just my skin tone. It's not like Brian Lyle's skin tone. I don't know if they make other models. Um, so, where was I? Okay, so we got uh, completely trolled all over our beautiful infrastructure. So that, by the way, was the whole talk that I was going to give you. So you can see how boring it would have been. Uh, but this is way more fun. So what actually happened was uh, a script that was run, that was supposed to be run in a user dedicated instance, ended up accident, ended up being run in the share Apache environment, which is unsecure, giving them root access to the share Apache environment. And not only that, and here is where the story starts to get really interesting. So shared access uh, or a shared Apache server had uh, basically Apache running as root without any real access control, without any real um, shrewd or otherwise containment for the individual applications. We also had shared uh, SSH keys, uh, private keys, for all those boxes on this box. Basically, if you can think of any stupid thing we could have done to make things easy for our hackers, we had done it. And so they got immediately off of the shared hosting box onto the cache machine, onto the load balancing machine, onto our database servers, even onto the phpphilip.com Rails application itself, which is where they found the Twitter password. <laughs> <laughs> Let me let that sink in for a second. <laughs> and then let me also point out that uh, the Twitter password was also the password to our Linode account and our DNS account. And our Google Apps account. I was unaware of this. I am now aware that they do not share the same passwords. <laughs> so uh, our entire infra got hacked, our Twitter got hacked, our blog got hacked, our DNS got hacked, and pointed uh, phpblog.com briefly at a site called phpblogsucks.com. <laughs> Uh, explaining the exploit and uh, making us, you know, look pretty stupid in the process. So we managed to regain control of our servers, which we shut down. We shut down uh, a little over a thousand application servers for our customers because while we didn't have any direct evidence that they were compromised, we just didn't want to take chances. There's no point in having someone else's private data also compromised for our stupidity. So we took all of our users' servers down, we took our servers down, we started figuring out how to bring them back up, how to tell people that this had happened and what we were going to do about it. Because the, the most important thing you have to do after a security breach like this is also the most painful thing. You have to tell people. You have to tell your customers that you fucked up, that their data may be insecure, and that you're going to do things to fix it but it's not going to happen overnight. It might not even happen in the next few days. The, the services are going to be down. And this is going to hurt. And it still hurts. And I did not like having to send those emails out. But what you have to remember right now in, in this moment is that the bad thing already happened. The, the terrible thing is, has already happened in the past. You can't control that anymore. All you can control now is how you respond to the situation. So what you do is you disclose honestly any security vulnerabilities that may affect your customers and how and what they can do to fix it. Changing their passwords, uh, removing data, making sure they don't share passwords like we stupidly did with other services that could be compromised. Now in our case, the actual exposure for our customers was minimized. We don't have any credit card information in our servers uh, because we're PCI compliant. So there's no possibility of, of uh, stolen credit card information. We hash, uh, obviously, we don't store plain text passwords in the database. But one thing I think uh, 
Jim did a great talk about Rails app security. But one thing I think a lot of people don't realize is that the SHA-512 or, or SHA-2 encryption that we use, uh, the cryptographic hashing function that we use to hash our, our, our passwords into the database, even if we use a, a unique salt and all of the industry standard best practices, is brute forceable. I can, for $300 an hour, buy enough compute hardware on Amazon using cluster GPUs to brute force 500 billion passwords a second for $300 an hour. SHA-512 SHA is not intended uh, as a cryptographically secure means to prevent brute force attacks on your password database. It's just not. It's not going to work. If, you're, if your database is compromised, you have to assume that all those passwords either are or will be compromised. So you have to send out, you know, a few thousand, a few hundred thousand, a few million password reset emails. All of your users have to reset their passwords. If they use those passwords on other sites, because a lot of people do stupid things like share passwords on their Twitter, and their Lino, and their DNS, <laughs> and their Google Apps. So people do that in the real world, obviously. So let them know if they did that. They need to go change those passwords there, too, and stop sharing your password. Use something like 1Password or LastPass so you have strong, unique passwords for all of your services. It's, it's stupid not to do so, and sometimes you can be criminally negligent as a company if you fail to take into, in these you know, procedures into, into, into uh, account and do your due diligence. So be, be careful. You know, don't assume that the, the Shaw uh, hashing function you use is secure. Assume that if your attacker has got your database, that anything in there is, is susceptibly or is, is potentially compromised. Reset your user's passwords. Make sure that if you have any any billing IDs, any any uh, any keys to any services, that you immediately take all of those down, regenerate them. Don't for a second assume. Uh, that you know the extent of the, of the compromise. You, or, I'm sorry, of the amount of uh, systems that were compromised. You don't know the extent. There, are, there could be rootkits on, on every single one of your drives. Uh, all of your services, you know, all of your all of your passwords could be compromised. Just assume everything is compromised and start over. It's the only way to really, really be sure that you're protecting your users' data, that you're protecting your own, your own data as well. So after you've regained control, after you've shut your systems down, after you've, you've disclosed to your users the nature of the exploit, what damage may have caused to them, you have to start recovering. So the worst possible thing you can do right now is turn on those systems that were just hacked. If you, if you don't know why that is, you don't understand the nature of the hack or the nature of security. If you think you can turn it on, clean the system out, find any possible um, root kit or, or other trojan that, that was left on there, you, you really don't know anything. So the only the only way you can recover properly is start from scratch. <laughs> rebuild rebuild your servers. If you're running on a, on a, a cloud, just Fire up new servers. It's trivial. If you're if you're running on real hardware, reinstall the operating system. Don't try to recover anything from the systems that were affected. It's just it's going to end in yet another disaster, and you only really get one shot at this. Uh, we we were talking earlier. We had a, a great talk about Ruby configuration management for systems. The only way we were able to rebuild about 1,200 servers over the course of two days is by using configuration management. So we, we isolated the attack vectors. We figure out how they got into our system. We realized in hindsight that they should never have gotten in that way because it was an obvious and, and trivial hack. But now we have to move forward and we have to rebuild a more secure system. So. And the, the weird thing about this is it's, it's not as if we collectively as an organization didn't know anything about security. It's just that we had really bad priorities. 
So when we rebuilt our infrastructure, we knew how to properly secure our SSH by using a bastion host and not allowing SSH directly into boxes within our infrastructure. We knew how to do that. We just didn't do it because we didn't really have time because we're supposed to be launching and that gets in the way of our launch schedule. So why, why do it now? Just do it later. So we just had really, really stupid, shitty priorities. But what this ended up being was an opportunity for us to rebuild our system from scratch with security uh, as our first consideration and to do it properly. And if you don't know how to do it properly, find someone who does, find someone who's really smart, and pay them money so they'll tell you what to do. Sometimes you just have to acknowledge that you don't have the competency you, you need to deal with a situation. I think it's a major failing of very smart people that they assume the competency in one area that means or implies they automatically have competency in some other area that they really don't. If you're not a security person, hire some security people to help you fix the problems and to create a security procedure for you so you can be more and more secure as you move forward. So if you have to start the work of improving the security for the systems that were compromised, fix all of the holes that you know about, and then find as many more as you can and fix those too. Finally, once all of that's done, do a audit of the system one more time, start reconnecting, Reconnect your servers, bring your services back online. If any users were affected, always bring your users back <coughs> online first because they don't really care so much that my blog is down, that the company blog is down, if their server is still down. They really don't. Get your users back online first, then worry about your own infrastructure. And finally, and the only way to save some face and regain some, some measure of, of trust from your users, is to begin with a very honest admission of, of guilt. Uh, I, I actually think that uh, our CEO, Lucas, on our blog posted a very strong post detailing exactly what happened and, and the steps that we were taking to, to work towards improving our security. And you, you can't skip this step. If you look at, there have been a lot of security breaches recently. Um, RSA, who uh, provides you know, secure logging for Bank of America and a thousand other banks, has just been breached. Um, PHP itself has had a recent security breach. There have been a lot of security breaches, and if historically the only way companies that have security breaches regain trust is by being honest and open and transparent about what happened. Detailing the exact nature of the exploit, detailing the exact nature of the fixes you're putting in place, the ways you're hardening the system, the new policies and procedures that you hope will prevent this sort of the sort of um, root cause in the future, and the root cause here isn't a 16-year-old kid in Australia, the root cause here is our terrible priorities, our poorly, uh, our poorly thought out trade-offs in terms of security versus other considerations in terms of business uh, goals and whatnot. So the root cause isn't the hacker. It's, it's not actually the hacker's fault that we got hacked, it's our fault that we got hacked. So the first thing you have to do is acknowledge that and be honest. And as an open, as a company, you know, founded on open source principles that is built on open source technology, we don't believe in security through obscurity. We think we can tell you how we're secure and still be secure. So that's what we did. So I would like uh, to close with a few quotes that I, that I think sum up my feelings about security. Uh, they're both by Bruce Schneier, who uh, is a very well-known security expert. He's written a couple of great books on cryptographic security that if you care at all about the security of systems and infrastructure in general and the thought processes uh, behind making things secure, which is a very strange um, uh, modality for someone who's used to being a, an engineer and a developer, you have to think like a criminal, you have to think like a hacker. And that's just not, that's not a, that's a no normal way of thinking for most developers. So I would highly recommend picking up his books. I, I wish I had time to link to them, but I'll put up, uh, I'll Twitter uh, some links to those on Amazon. Uh, the first quote is that security is not a product, it's a process. That means that you can't hire someone to come in and take your money and give you security. It doesn't exist. What you can do is be consistently improving the factors in your system um, 
towards more security and away from vulnerabilities. It's a, it's a constant process. You're never going to stop and say, OK, I'm done now. Everything is secure. And the second quote, and this is the one that really bites up most people, is that security is a chain, and it's only as secure as the weakest link. Most hacks are not one large gaping hole in a system. There are a series of smaller vulnerabilities that if you exploit them correctly can lead to a much larger, uh, to a much larger exploit. So for instance, uh, there it was a expo exploit on the BlackBerry phone where you could read user secured quote encrypted data. And the problem was not that BlackBerry didn't encrypt it, didn't use a, a you know an industry standard uh, encryption algorithm. The problem was that they used a two-layer encryption algorithm and they just skimped on the first layer. They did only one pass of this iterative algorithm because they thought the second layer would make up for it. And it didn't, and they were hacked. And if you look at, from what I understand, BlackBerry's uh, one iteration compares to iOS 3's uh, 3,000 and iOS 4's 10,000 iterations. So don't assume that just because you're using something that has a certificate saying it's secure that you're using it properly. Don't just assume that because you put a lot of mon uh, money and effort into securing you know, most of the system that it's secure, because any small, any small breach can undermine the rest of the security of the entire system. So I hope uh, that you guys have some questions for me. I'd, I'd love to talk about maybe, uh, maybe afterwards, uh, after the, at the end of the day, about more detail about the nature of the exploit and, and what we're doing uh, in terms of inter infrastructure, how we're handling it, so what, what the new uh, precautions are that we're putting in place. I hope, uh, honestly, that I scared the shit out of you. And I hope if anyone here learns from my experience and avoids, uh, avoids this uh, personal catastrophe for themselves, then I, I think I've done a good job. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. I, I've got a few minutes. Let me start uh, back right. Uh, I, just, I don't really have a question, but I just wanted to get decrypt, which is a yes. hashing algorithm. Actually, if uh, if you're using, for instance, uh, OpLogic, the default the default encryption or the default hashing algorithm is uh, SHA, but you can also switch out decrypt with just uh, a one-line code change. And decrypt provides far better brute force protection because it, it, it allows it, um, it basically increases exponentially the compute time required to solve the password based on the weighting factor. So whereas, whereas SHA-1's encryption doesn't take a lot of time, it's not designed to take a lot of time, it's not designed to be CPU intensive, you can encrypt a password in often a millisecond to, to five milliseconds. With bcrypt, you can force it to take as long as you want. You can force it to take three seconds, meaning that brute force uh, a brute force approach to, to gaining a password that's decrypt encrypted could take literally until the heat death of the universe to, to, to finish. So I highly recommend if you're using SHA switch to decrypt. Absolutely. Any other questions? In the back here. Yeah, I was um I read your blog on the web and I was really imp impressed by um, your interactions with the hackers. It sounded like you had a pretty amicable conversation with them. Yeah, how, so how common is that? And like any suggestions? When you, take you are talking to a hacker who has the keys to your kingdom, the last thing you want to do <laughs> is make them mad. <laughs> you just want to get them back. So I don't know how common it is. Uh, our our only real consideration at that point was how can we make him not do things we don't want him to do? Like, you know, honestly, what what he did was was criminal, but it could have been a lot worse. He went in, he stole some stuff, and he posted it. He could have removed all of our all of our files, all of our data. He could have done a lot of, of worse things that he, he didn't do. So we were we were lucky in that regard. And there's no point antagonizing someone because we don't have any power in terms of a, a negotiation relationship. We just want you to please be nice to us and stop hurting us. Yes. Um, as far as the, the user's data and applications go, did you have to nuke those as well? No. Um, we, to the best of our knowledge, our user's data uh, have not been compromised. 
which is a, which is a good thing. We managed to compartmentalize at least that much. Could the hacker have gained access to that, or is this just some sort of security measure against that from the beginning? The really stupid thing we did, where we uh, had shared public key access across machines within our infra, we didn't do in that case. Um, there was short of basically it, it, there, there, there was no way for the for the exploit to contaminate the, those systems. Um, there was there was no path for our systems to, to their systems. Okay. Uh, the only path was through uh, an app RPC uh, protocol that they didn't have access to, and through SSH keys on the machines themselves to get repositories that they didn't have access to. Okay. Start now with a security policy that includes obvious things like not sharing passwords, like using secure passwords. Your strong, you know, strong randomly generated passwords. Start now with a, a security policy that includes the things you'd have to be stupid not to do anyway, because some people will be stupid and do it, and then build from there, and then continuously maintain it. Yeah, go ahead. Um, just as quick follow-up, and, and this is like extensive question for before, before people. <coughs> We knew this was the wrong way to do it, but maybe laziness was to attribute and you know, is, you know we can all look and see where we're being lazy in our own way. Like, so that's why I'm asking about like, Did you see the same thing in the previous job? Hey, Ray, can you repeat yeah. the question if possible? I'm sorry, I can. So the question was uh, looking back at previous job experience that I've had, can I see any a pattern of of laziness? Uh, like in terms knowing of that, like, knowing, like, home. Oh, we're all using the same password. Knowing, knowing, knowing that you were doing a stupid thing or there's something you need to do security-wise and then just putting it off and, and, and being lazy about implementing it. I think many organizations are not as secure as they think they are, and many organizations like ours are lazy when it comes to security that they don't think is actually presenting a real attack vector. You know, we didn't think that our shared passwords were an attack vector, and now we know how wrong we were. Uh, I can see in, in, in previous work experience there have been times where we've used shared passwords and luckily it, you know, in those in those situations it didn't come back to bite us or hadn't, you know, yeah, it, it may eventually and it doesn't mean it's right, right? You know, you still you still should be doing the correct thing. And I think security is really the area where if you know you should do a thing and you don't do it, that you've made a, a grave and, and often fatal error. It's one of the few places in, in, in engineering and what we do where you really just can't cut corners, you can't wait until tomorrow. This this entire hack happened because a fix that I was going to deploy on Friday didn't get deployed. That would have closed off this attack vector. So don't wait. If you know that you have security vulnerabilities, they are now your top priority. And if you can't make them your top priority, figuring out why that is is now your top priority. Uh, Jim, do you have a question? I, I was just going to point out that you made some really good points about your server and, and securing that. But uh, uh, we had we had edge case. We go to conferences a lot, and we had some laptops hacked at one of the conferences too. So uh, it's not just your servers; it's right. your laptops and everywhere you go. You you have to think about containment. That's that's <coughs> the first key when it comes to security. Is if and when you do get breached, containing the results of that breach as much as possible. For instance, if we hadn't have had shared private keys to our other infra, if we hadn't had a Twitter password lying around, things would be much different. We would have had a, a rooted server without access to our blog, without access to our Twitter, without access to our database. The ramifications would have been much less. So compartmentalization, for instance, in using different passwords on different sites so that if one of them gets cracked, your entire network isn't, isn't, isn't also uh, exploited. 
compartmentalization is, is, is the first keyword when it comes to security. You have to expect that you may get that. you may get exploited, and when you do, you want to minimize the damage. Yeah. Questions? Yes. How's it affected the business so far in terms of customers? Well, um, it's interesting. Our community has actually been surprisingly supportive while this was going on. Uh, they're obviously, I'm sorry? Yeah, the question was, how has this affected the business? Uh, our community has been surprisingly supportive. Supportive. There are obviously a lot of people who have trust issues now with uh, with our services, and that's expected. I, I would in their situation. So now we just we work slowly through transparency to, to build that trust back. But for I, I think we're actually very uh, very fortunate that many of our users have been very supportive and understanding of, of what we're going through. Because I think. A lot of them are also developers, and they kind of they understand what it's like to be in a situation like this. So we're very lucky, I think. And is that everything? All right, I am on time. That's great. Thank you so much, guys.